Uh, okay, we're good. We are live. Okay, everybody. Drew here, thatanxietyguy.com. Back again for another podcast with the fabulous Holly Kotze <laughs> from Mallorca in the blazing heat, as always. How's it going, Holly? Yeah, good. Good. Hot, but good. Yeah, hot, but good. We are going to go through, and I'm going to look down at my, my phone. I have Kindle up on my phone here, so forgive me if I'm reading I've as I go. Yeah, there we go. Very old copy. The old, <laughs> Holly's going old school. I'm going high tech here. So we are going to go through chapter four of Hope and Help for Your Nerves. Uh, if you've been following along, it's the Claire Weeks book. We were just talking written in the early 60s, and um, hopefully you've been following along. So we're going to go through chapter four today. It's a really long chapter, so let's get into it right away, I think. Uh, this chapter is entitled The Commonest, Simplest Form of Nervous Illness. And the way Dr. Weeks starts the chapter is to just start going through like a laundry list of anxiety symptoms, which I think Holly would we'd probably agree that's the number one topic of discussion anywhere oh, yeah. what are online. Your symptoms? Yes, anywhere, anywhere that people with anxiety gather, the number one topic of discussion <laughs> is symptoms. So she gets us started here talking about um, a laundry list of anxiety symptoms. Uh, maybe we could go through a couple of them. Should we go through yeah, a little bit of a list? I mean, it, it, I know that they're very common. It's kind of everything common. you can imagine, but yeah. <laughs> it's, it's true. She talks about almost everyone. She basically gives us a list of uh, symptoms that people have brought into real doctors, I guess, in Australia, where yeah. she was from, and to herself. And she goes through a few of them. Fatigue, what she calls churning stomach, which I think, I don't know anybody who talks about churning stomach anymore. I always say, like, I have a knot in my stomach. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, upset, flutters in your tummy. Uh, churning stomach, indigestion, racing heart, banging heart, palpitations, missed heartbeats. That's huge. Um, yeah. That's a symptom for me that they're actually a slightly irregular heartbeat or skipped heartbeats. Uh, pain, sh uh, sharp pains in the chest, sore feeling in the chest, pins and needles, a choking feeling. We could probably go through just an Inability to take a deep breath. Yes, so many of them. Tight feelings across the chest. That's a big one for me. Yeah, yeah, that's and a big one. And under the skin, tight bone of pain around the head, heavy weight pressing on top of head, yep. giddiness, that's a massive one for me, giddiness, strange tricks of vision, such as apparent movement of inanimate objects, um, weak spells, sleeplessness, depression, nausea, occasional vomiting, diarrhea, frequent desires of fast urine. It's yeah, like she, just everything. It's just a big long laundry list. And we could go for two hours and talk about anxiety symptoms. Uh, just one quick clarification. Giddiness is not something that we hear about a lot in the US. I think we would probably call oh, okay. that... I think that probably speaks to like the depersonalization thing or possibly even a little bit of dizziness or disorientation. Is that, yeah, that I would right? call it so, yeah, disorientation, disorientation, I guess, like yeah. just sort of like ooh, yeah, woosiness, I, don't I think guess. We, we don't generally use the word giddiness. So I remember when I first read the book, I'm like, yeah, to me, get, being giddy is like being silly and happy. But so yeah. we use the word giddiness. <laughs> oh, I'm giddy, you know. Uh, so at any rate, so she goes through this long list of, of uh, very common anxiety symptoms. I think most of the people listening to us could probably relate to it, uh, many of them. Um, mm. and, and I'll throw out there that she's going to talk about how, you know, the bottom line here is to understand that those symptoms are not the problem. They're not dangerous. Yeah. That's not the problem. And she, she goes into what I think is the real crux of the book, which is her that whole sensitization, bewilderment, and fear thing, which is she starts to talk about that next, I think, uh, which is really what she talks a lot about. It's almost really her main approach to nervous illness or whatever she wants to call it. Um, and, and I think sensitization is probably where we should start, where everything becomes yeah. a trigger. Yeah. Well, just to quickly say, she, just before she goes on to that, she just says that rarely people... Sometimes, like, because they focus so much on their symptoms, they think that there's something, like, physically wrong with them. And they're, that well, they used to be, anyway, quite unaware at this point that, like, it was actually, like, an emotional sort of, like, a well-recognized pattern of symptoms that are caused by, like, emotional stress that then is these adrenaline symptoms. That, that's yeah. true. Uh, and I, that's so, a really good point that I'm glad you brought that up because so many people get stuck on the physical symptoms and yeah. trying to just beat down the symptoms fix the symptoms and it would go away and as you'll see as we go further her she postulates that the symptoms are not the problem at all they're just symptoms yeah. and, and, and I, it's kind of irrelevant which symptoms you've got as well like they're all caused by the same thing like the adrenaline mm -hmm. or like the hyperventilation and so like it's kind of irrelevant whether you get this one or this one the chest or the stomach or you know it's just like that's not the problem the problem is the way you react to them and yeah so yes that is very that is very very true 
So let's go through, I think, we'll, we'll, it's such a long chapter, we'll have to try and move it along yeah. as best we can. So let's go through sensitization, where she talks about sensitization. And I think I hear people talk in the forums online all the time about triggers. You know, what's my, yeah. what are my triggers? What are, and I think that's what she's talking about here, where you become Definitely. sensitized to everything. Uh, and I, I like her, she talks about the cleaner's broom against his, bread, his bed, which is such a, an interesting... She picks the strangest like an analogies or examples, <laughs> but it's true. This is where she talks about where even just the shock of the I think she's talking about being in the hospital and the janitors, the cleaners put it, you know, just hitting his broom, leaning his broom yeah. against the wall or against the bed. Just that sound could send him, send someone into a tizzy. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably true. That's where you become so sensitized to, and everything becomes a trigger. So I, did you have anything in particular on that that? Um, just, uh, she said the like um, the simple shock of tripping in the dark may be enough to bring a flash of panic to a severely sensitized person. So yeah, yeah, like it's true. It's I know. just uh, for me, for sure. Like it could be like just a loud. No, I remember like I was driving once, and my boyfriend at the time was listening to a football match, and his team scored, and he was like, "Yes, goal!" And like he, like him going, "Like yes, goal!" Like actually, like threw me into a panic attack. I got really angry with him. Like, how dare you do that? And like, it's just like <laughs> he was just cheering his team, man. It was my problem, you know. That <laughs> like, is so funny. Yeah. Uh, just, just for one quick second, though, Holly, if you could try and bring your mic down just a little more. A little yeah, more. Just okay. a little more if you can. Uh, and I completely relate to that. For me, one of the strangest things that I always had was even a change in the light. So right now there's a window right next to me. And it's pretty sunny where I am, where it was anyway. But um, if a cloud went across the sun and the, the light changed just a little bit, or if that happened while I was driving, that could trigger me. It was just the strangest, any old thing, a sound, anything. Uh, so this is what she's talking about here when she talks about sensitization, where you're so overly sensitized that just about anything can start to trigger that flood of anxiety and fear and panic. Yeah, totally. Yeah, go up a little bit more, just a little bit from where you are, and oh, you'll, we'll be now, great. Okay. Yeah, just up a little bit, and we'll be I awesome. realized I'd forgotten to perfect. save my audio. Perfect. So yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> so uh, we're getting it. It's only taken us four episodes to figure out the audio part of this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, all right, we're good with that. So from sensitization, she starts to go, she talks about fear. I think fear is big and fear of the unknown, not yeah. knowing what's going on. She has a nice little subheading called, they fear the unknown as much, no, they fear the unknown as much as the known. Yes. So like people are scared of their symptoms, but they're also scared of like what extra things might happen to them or what like these symptoms could mean and like all these unknown things. So it's like, they're not only like scared of the way that they're feeling, but they're scared of like what might happen next. And what she tries to sort of like make clear is that your symptoms follow a pattern. And so once you're, especially once your pattern's been sort of like established, it's actually quite hard. Like th there isn't any surprises. Like people think they're going to pass out, you know, because they feel this giddiness or dizziness, you know. And like, she's like, you're not going to pass out because that's not one of the pattern. That's not one of the actual symptoms of anxiety, you know? So right. it's like, yeah, that's true. And I think fearing the unknown where, well, I know how I feel and it, it's must, it's going to get worse. Like, I think we interpret those symptoms as what it's going to lead to, like you said, passing out or having a heart attack or a stroke or going crazy. Uh, and none of those things ever happen. But yet we fear them anyway, and that and that adds to the adrenaline fear cycle. It adds to being more sensitized. So it's just this, this horrible cycle. Once you get stuck yeah. in it, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And you know, it's hard enough to just stand upright sometimes without trying to remain calm. So yeah, uh, it, it's. I like that she does. That is, you know, that her her first sensitization bewilderment fear. That's the first thing she brings up. I think it's, it's good. Uh, and bewilderment, they fear the unknown as as much as the. They fear the unknown as much as the known, I, I think, is that bewilderness because they don't people we just don't understand. And I think especially people who are starting to experience anxiety issues at the beginning, you know, when they're first, it's new to them. And yeah. it's this great unknown. Something must be horribly wrong with me. It can't oh, yeah, just be, yeah. 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 And, and that's huge. Just not knowing what it is, I think, is such a huge thing. And when she talks about bewilderment, I think that's exactly what she's talking about. And we probably have yeah. a leg up because we have so we, we're doing this right now. I mean, you're on the other yeah. side of the world and we're we're talking about this. People are watching. And that didn't exist in 1962. So no. Can you imagine like you'd have to go to the library to try and find any form of self-help or something, you know, right. like hope there was a book or go see a doctor who would tell you you were suffering from nerves and yeah so i could completely understand why she spends a lot of time talking about 
not knowing and just being unsure of what the heck is going on. But I think these days we do have a leg up because we can communicate with each other so well, share information. But yet, I'm still amazed. They're probably, I don't know. I, yeah, I, yeah. I would argue that a lot of the, you know, when you see in like the forums and stuff, the biggest problem a lot of people have is that they have a diagnosis, but they don't necessarily know what that means or how to get better from it, you know? Like, yes. it's just they get given that diagnosis and then they're like, all oh, right, so I've got panic disorder. So that's me for life then, you know? And it's like, it isn't. Right. Oh, <laughs> Your right. doctor's not explained it properly then or, you know. That's true. Or I have panic disorder or I have generalized anxiety disorder. And therefore, how do I stop my heart from racing? Or how do I yeah. stop that dizziness thing? So I think there's still a lack of understanding or there's a, there's a tremendous amount of unknown, even though we might know now, yes, you have panic disorder, you have generalized anxiety. Maybe it is a doctor's. I don't, I don't know. There's just not enough explanation. It's, well, this is what this really is. And this is how we're going to go about treating that. It's just yeah. a diagnosis, sometimes a prescription, and you're off and running, and people are still bewildered. You know, she would call it bewildered, not, not really knowing. Yeah. So even though we have so many resources and we're able to communicate so readily, there's still a lot of people who, especially in the beginning of their journey, are just terrified, you know, on a hair trigger, sensitized, and still in the dark. It's, it's sort exactly. of a shame. Yeah. So I guess let's move on. She, she's talking about, yeah. hey, Vronsky. <laughs> oh, sorry. I forgot you could hear her. Vronsky. Love Vronsky. That's okay. That's, sorry, Holly, that's Holly's cat. dog. She's the best. Um, so funny. Okay. Let, so let's talk about being concerned with the way we feel. Yeah, there's an interesting Huge. bit in the, in the, I just want to read a little passage from the book. She says, I wish to stress very strongly that many sufferers from nervous illness have no specific problem keeping them ill other than finding the way to recovery. The great majority of my nervously ill patients have been made ill and kept ill because of the way they feel, because of fear of what they think may happen next. And so like, that's the whole, like, that's the whole crux of like, what's keeping you ill isn't, is you, you know, like, and you're not, uh, you, you, you haven't found the way to get better yet, you know, like, it, there's nothing actually keeping you ill other than, than you. And it's a really hard thing to accept because people would say, I would never do this to myself. Yes. You know, like, of course, I'm not making myself ill. And it's just like, it's not that you're making yourself ill. It's just that right. you, you need to make a change to the way you're dealing with it to be able to get better from it. It's and to, you know, I think people resist that so much. It's a good thing people don't actually know where you are because they'd be sending hate mail to you right now. I, yeah. I, I'm joking a little <laughs> bit, but you know, when you say the thing that's keeping you ill is you, I've seen people get really angry. What do you mean really I'm keeping defensive. myself? Yes, of course. Yeah. I, oh, I choose to be this way. No, we never choose to be this way. But no. what she's, what Dr. Weeks is really saying here is that you're just, and we talked about this last week too, what really drives it and what gets you over the edge from being just nervous or anxious to having an actual disorder that starts mm. to impact your lifestyle is becoming afraid of the symptoms. You're afraid of how you feel. Yeah. And that is what, once you get into that territory, well, now you got to approach this a whole different way. Um, and, and this is what she starts talking about. And she ta then she goes to the fear, adrenaline, fear cycle, which I, I kind of feel like we went over that in a previous yeah. chapter. Well, so what it is here, she's like now, she now then just describes like a general sort of like pattern of how, a person develops like full-blown nervous illness so she starts at the beginning like maybe they feel palpitations and so they're just like what's this and then they start and they're feeling palpitations because they're like super stressed already or something and it's so their body's releasing adrenaline it causes one of the symptoms like palpitations they start to notice it mm -hmm. because they're sensitized to their body and how their body is working because i mean like i think heart like healthy hearts palp have palpitations all the time it's yeah. just that you don't we notice don't feel them. them right we don't feel yeah. them yeah but like when you're sensitized and like you're so like you're sort of like internally scanning your body the whole time for like anything that could possibly be going wrong you know like you start to interfere with the automatic workings of your body like listening like have i remembered to breathe i see people saying like oh you know yeah. and i like i caught myself not breathing and it's <laughs> do you know what i mean like yes. our bodies do function without us thinking about each heartbeat and stuff but when we become so nervously ill and aware we just not we notice we're like oh my god my heart just skipped a beat oh my god does this mean i'm dying and then they have more fear then the adrenaline comes because they're fearful and then because the adrenaline comes they have more of these 
adrenaline symptoms, which cause them more fear, and there's the cycle. That's so. that vicious cycle that just feeds upon itself. Yeah. So it's there's you know we'll talk we're, as we go further through the book we'll talk about ways to break that cycle. But I think for now it's just understanding that you are sensitized, you are in a hair trigger that it's the fear of how you feel that's keeping you that way and and at least understanding what that fear adrenaline fear cycle is so before yeah. you can try and fix it or break that cycle you have to at least acknowledge that that's there and that's what's happening right now knowledge um, is is power in it's this, huge in it's this huge whole thing. except that I, I think as you go through the book as we go through the book knowledge is power but we deal with just knowing what it is doesn't necessarily solve the problem yeah. um but go, knowing what it is certainly helps it's the first step so yeah uh, <laughs> the next part that she goes through where she said it's tension through fear that don't overdo it i love this part of the chapter because i, I think it it speaks to what a lot of people do. Hey, <laughs> as Holly says, we're making a guest appearance. <laughs> oh, wasn't sorry. I I was making hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It's okay. No big deal. But um, she talks about somebody, you know, nervous sufferer goes to the doctor. The doctor reassures this person. It's okay. You're, you're all good. But, you know, better, better take things easy, better not overdo it. And so I think we, we have this, these conflicting signals where you'll hear people, maybe like me or you, who will tell people, you know, you really have to confront the fear. You have to get out there and expose yourself to the things that you fear. You have to learn to face yeah. them. But at the same time, there's that, you know, yeah, but, but take it easy. Don't go too hard. Yeah, to go yeah. Be gentle. And so there's that tension that gets created where, well, I, I know I'm supposed to confront this fear, but I'm not supposed to push it. And when I confront the fear, I get more afraid. And so it just builds even more tension. So I think this is big for me, that whole be gentle, be good to yourself, take it slow, take it easy. Yeah. Uh, I have a hard time with that a little bit. I, I don't. I'm not trying to tell people to go from stuck on the sofa to trying to climb Mount Everest, but I feel really strongly that when she talks about building more fear through tension, this addresses that. Like you do have to go in small steps, but each step is an effort and it's okay to make the effort. So when you're making yeah. that effort, you're going to feel more fear. That's okay. So backing away from it, like, oh, I can't do that because I got more afraid. Well, that's, you're supposed to get more afraid. Like you have, yeah, to, yeah. You have to get more afraid before you get less afraid. So I find this this is a big topic for me, that whole thing of like, yes, take it slow and be methodical step by step, but it doesn't mean to back away from the fear. I don't know if does that make any sense? And and I think that's what she's talking about. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So And it, then it, she says you get like the other reaction as well, where like um because she was saying that like the doctor might be saying, I don't think the doc necessarily the doctor would say this these days, but in those days the doctor might say like, oh, you know, don't overdo it. And then like they'll sort of like, she says it can create more brooding and worry over their like bad heart, you know, which because they haven't got a bad heart, but right. you know, the doctor sort of told them to take it easy. And so they think that like, oh, maybe he told me to take it easy so that I don't stress my heart, you know, and that's stuff right. like that. It's just like, no, that's not really the key and then like the other the other flip side is that the the doctor might like make too much light of it and just be like oh no you're just suffering nerves don't worry about it you can you can carry on and then they think like well the doctor must have missed something serious like you know he didn't run every single test on my heart or you know he didn't run every test that literally exists for all these symptoms that i've got you know he's dismissed it as of of something and so there must be something seriously wrong with me that even the doctor hasn't caught and so yeah that creates more, more tension fear. and exactly. more worry tension more fear more fear. fear of the unknown that thing that the doctor missed or what i've also seen happen is people may be afraid that the doctor missed something uh, there's something seriously wrong and no one's finding it um but also there's that but then there's also the well what do you mean i'm, I'm okay like i must have the worst anxiety ever yeah. because the doctor's saying i'm supposed to be okay and i'm obviously not okay yeah so people get freaked out over that too i think to a certain extent like i, I i'm obviously not okay even though this the doctor over here 10 doctors have told me i'm okay but don't they know that i'm not and in yeah, reality yeah. it goes right back to the you know you really are okay which are really the problem really is that you're afraid of how you feel and like we talked about before so there's a whole lot to read into that. She does specifically start to mention panic. You know, she mentions fear of other bodily sensations. I think she tries to go through a lot of symptoms and address a lot of them. And then she just sort of has this couple of paragraphs where she just talks about a catch-all fear of other upsetting bodily sensations. And, yeah. Yeah, you know, we hear about that all the time. If you look on the forums or the Facebook groups and, and whatnot, people will talk about, you see, at least once a day, you're going to see somebody ask that question. 
well, today, you know, my hair felt funny. Is that anxiety? Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. any possible thing that we can think about. Like, well, my fingernail seems a little itchy. So is, yeah, is that anxiety? I had a strange pain in this part of my hand. Is right. that anxiety? Does anybody else get that? Yeah. So you're right. We become afraid of every possible sensation. So she does mention that. And then she talks specifically about panic. You know, she, she has a subheading here called panic. Some people, as well as having background of disturbing sensations, are swept from time to time by intense waves of panic. So she specifically acknowledges that not only can you just feel generally anxious and, and yeah. afraid and on edge and at the edge of panic, but she specifically acknowledges that, yes, there are times when you literally will go into a panic. Um, full-blown. Yeah. Full-blown panic. And, and, you know, I think we, we know what that is. You know, so she's specifically mentioning this at this point, a full-blown panic attack where that's it. You're at level 10. You're convinced that you're dying. You know, that's the call 911 or whatever your emergency yeah. numbers are here in the States, 911. Um, but and she's, she, I think it's really big that she mentions it, but it's funny that she doesn't talk about it that much. She, she gives us like two paragraphs about panic. Yeah, but well, the, panic sucks. Yeah, <laughs> pa panic could happen too. And then she just sort of moves on, which I think so many people listening to us or watching us probably would think, yeah, hello, that's, the that's why I'm listening. That's like the main whole That's why I'm thing. here, yeah. right. You know, and, and she just kind of throws it in there like, as an afterthought. Yeah, exactly. Because that's what yeah. we're afraid of. We're afraid of how we feel, but we're, I think we're really afraid that it's going to lead to that worst case scenario, which is panic. Which, yeah. you know, so she mentions it, but sort of as almost a throwaway. And uh, up next, she talks about, you know, it's the why doesn't he pull up his socks or, you know, what is your, <laughs> the note they yeah. say, you know, why doesn't get he hold of yourself, socks, old man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've got to fight this thing, old man. Yes, yes, I love that in her 1940s movie dialogue writing <laughs> that she uses. <laughs> you have to fight um, this thing. Why don't we talk about that yeah. a little bit? Why doesn't he pull up his socks? I think that's that when people hear that it's all in your head, just get it together, pull yourself together. It's difficult subject to that because it's kind of like it isn't the it isn't the case that like you just need to pull your socks up. Like it's it's awful because um, and now like these days like there's so much more awareness about anxiety and, and panic and stuff and, and like mental health, you know, like and it's such a sort of like you know like stop the stigma and so like people kind of know not to say to people like oh it's all in your head or like you need to pull your socks up sort of thing yeah. um and so but it almost has like a slight this may be a bit controversial but it can have like a slight detrimental effect by sort of being like how dare you tell me it's just my attitude or my you know like the 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 powers within me to sort of like stop it because you know of course i would stop it if i could do and it's just like unfortunately they're like they're not right in in what they're saying but like there is an element of what they're saying that is right. like they don't realize they're right but they kind of are do you know what i mean yes i totally do get that, sort of saying that? And, it, and it is when you say it's controversial it is it, it really when you talk about this people get really hot about it and usually it's whether it's or not, it's a doctor or a caregiver of some sort or just a significant other in your life, a husband, wife, whatever, yeah. boyfriend, girlfriend, a friend, a parent, a sibling, you know, get it together. It's all in your head. What I try and explain is I think the reason why people we get told it's all in our heads or, or just why doesn't he pull up his socks or you have to fight this old man, you know, like she says, because what we're dealing with really are, are phobic responses and a phobia is irrational. So when you are terrified that that racing heart means that you're having a heart attack or dying, that is an irrational fear. I mean, you have to accept that the fear, our fears are, are, are pretty much irrational. And yeah. the person looking at that, your wife, your husband, your best friend, whoever it is, your doctor, understands that your heart is racing, but they know that you're not in danger. So what I think that why doesn't he pull up his socks up or just get it together? You got to pull yourself together or it's all in your head is really just I try and use it as a positive. So I think of it as like if you have children, they may decide one day that they don't want to go to bed because there's a monster under their bed. And they're that's real fear for that kid. They don't want to go to bed yeah. because there's something hiding in the closet. Now, as a parent, you know that there's nothing in the closet. You know there's nothing under the bed. So you try to comfort and support as best you can. But sooner or later, you have to make the kid go to bed and understand yeah. only through experience that, look, there's really nothing in the closet. And so when people tell us that it's all in our heads or that we have to pull ourselves together or that we should just you know fight it and get it together, I think all they're really saying is that there's no monster under the bed. So yeah. that's all they mean. They, they don't, they're not saying it right, but as opposed to being pissed off that somebody tells you that, just consider that that person, that normal person, 
doesn't have the same irrational fears that we do. So they're just pointing out that they don't see, they see your fear, but they don't see the danger. So yeah. why are you afraid? That's all they're pointing out, I think. So try and take that negative, what a lot of people take as a negative, and turn it into a positive. Let that person sort of guide you a little bit. Be like, like oh, okay, so right. I am being irrational because they're not scared of that. And exactly. so like, maybe I am, you know, like maybe it is a sort of, Yep. Fear thing I'm working with here. Th that's you know, what yeah. I try to do with this because you are right. People react very emotionally to this whole idea of just just get yourself together. It's all in your head kind of thing. And and she does talk about it near the end of the chapter. Uh, you know that whole you have to fight it. You have to pull yourself together. And I don't know for, for what it's worth. I that has helped me over the time. When people tell me those things, I try and understand that they're just trying to show me. They're just they're just pointing out the irrational aspect of what's going on in my head. Um, so, yeah. you know, when you're on the plane, if you're a little bit nervous, I don't like to fly. So if I'm nervous, I'll look at the flight attendants. If they're fine, then <laughs> all right, I guess I got to be fine, too. So it, it's if the, they're looking nervous, then yeah, then you maybe can definitely there's a problem. Be <laughs> exactly. I'm going for the flotation <laughs> device. But generally yeah. speaking, so anyway, that that for what it's worth, that's what I tend. That's how I tend to interpret that whole pull yourself together, you know, yeah. pull your socks up thing. Uh, I don't know if you have anything else that you wanted to add to that. It's. Mm, I can't really think what I, I can't actually remember what it is that she's saying. And oh, uh, I think it's just it, maybe it just makes the sufferer feel more isolated and stuff because their friends and stuff are just telling them, "Come on, it's all in your head," you know, yes. and they can't possibly understand what the other person's going through if they can sort of say that. Which so because she's at this point, she's still de like describing how the person becomes like more and more um, like you know, how they suffer more and more. And I think like that isolation is like quite a big part of it that like, there's this big void between like normal people and then you, the sufferer, like, because just everything's so huge and massive and terrible. Right. And if other people are saying like, oh, come on, you know, it's not that bad, pull your socks up, you know, don't worry about it. Then you're just like, well, then you've absolutely got zero idea of what I'm going through if you can say that, you know. And so it just creates this big sort of like, void and the sufferer just feels even more like alone with it i guess yeah, which yeah. is a big part of of the sort of you know alone or hopeless yeah, yeah hopeless as hopeless. well yeah, everybody's yeah. telling me i should just pull myself together and i can't and she even says um you know then you wind up going from doctor to doctor in some instances looking for the doctor who's not going to tell you that but that's never going to happen yeah. because there's really nothing wrong and she actually says to healthy people this history of going doctor to doctor may sound all too childish and stupid they think why doesn't he pull up his socks and get on with his work and forget all this nonsense uh, because to them it is they don't understand it they they they, they yeah. don't have share those irrational fears so i, I think you're right that it does i think especially in those days as well there's a lot more awareness of like sort of anxiety and stuff and like mental health sort of stuff these days yeah, so yeah. people might not be so sort of judgmental but i don't know maybe they are i don't know <laughs> maybe they're just not so outward about it it could be but i think especially in those days like it would have just been like what do you mean you know and i think especially in those like days this. yeah and back when she wrote this book it, we were still in that era where i think it was more attributed to women than men and a man yeah. could never admit that they were going through this kind of problem it was really difficult but um so she talks about that, and then she, she goes on to talk specifically about fighting. I think this is a big part of the chapter, too. She talks about fighting yeah. it. Um, I like what she says. The sufferer from nervous illness is neither fool nor coward, which is, which is good, I think really good, but, but is often a remarkably brave person who fights his breakdown to the best of his ability with commendable, although often misdirected courage. And I think yeah. that, that statement at the beginning of the subheading called fighting is, is huge because it really encapsulates the misdirected effort that I think we put yeah. in, especially in the beginning. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you see people like, um, they're like, you know, I fight this every day, you know, and like if you had to go through what I go through, it would bring you to your knees. And so like, you know, like, cause you just to sort of stay <laughs> alive, even though you wouldn't actually die or anything. Do you know what I mean? It feels like you're right. exerting so much to just stay as normal as you possibly feel that you can you know like and so you like fighting this every day you know like to do anything is just like such a massive deal that so you you are you do have a lot of like fight in you and you're you're fighting it and you're fighting it but actually like it's just all that energy is actually going in 
the wrong, the wrong direction. direction and it's not getting you better it's actually like keeping you ill because <laughs> you're fighting the anxiety she literally says that as she get further down a few more paragraphs oh, really? down she says um you know he reasons that if he cannot become himself again by fighting how else can he fighting his natural is his natural defense the only weapon he knows so he fights even harder but the harder he fights the worse he becomes and yeah. and that really you know, and so, so many people start that way. We're trying to attack our symptoms, which is misdirected. And then we begin to just try and fight. Uh, and I say this all the time. If you're having a problem getting to the supermarket or to pick up your kids from school or getting to work because of anxiety or panic, you know, and, and you just white knuckle your way, you know, through that supermarket trip, fighting it all the way. You made it and, you know, you did it, and the fight was there, and you're exhausted, but tomorrow you'll have to fight it again because fighting it isn't the way to go. You yeah. can't, you can't That's white the knuckle mis- your way through it. I made that mistake, honestly, for years, like probably Everybody about does. 15 years I made that mistake. Everybody I does. white knuckled my way through my whole life, you know, yeah. and I was still doing, like, crazy stuff, like, um, and, like, traveling on my own and just doing all sorts of stuff that, like, even – like lots of normal people would sort of like find a bit scary or something. I was just like, no, I'll do it. But I was having just the most horrendous time the whole time through it. And I'd just be like, this is, this must just be my life forever now. You know, like this is just how my life is. I just have to, it's just more difficult than for anyone else because I'm having like, people don't realize that just meeting my friend down the pub is like just the hugest deal for me. But yeah, I still do it, but it's horrific. And, if only I'd realized, you know what I mean, like 15 years ago that like I didn't actually need to do that. It just life becomes so much easier when you stop fighting. <laughs> but I think that is so true. And it's but it is exactly the opposite of what we would think we should yeah. do here. And that's what makes this so difficult for people to grasp. It's it literally is doing the exact opposite of what every cell in your body is asking you to do uh, and fighting it. Everybody makes a mistake, though. You made it. I made it. Yeah. Everybody makes it. So if you are listening or watching right now, and that is the situation that you're in, and you maybe you're watching at the end of the day, and you had to white knuckle your way and grit your teeth and sweat and shake and near panic your way through an entire day at work, and this is the way every day goes for you. You're this is the way everybody tries it. So it's there's no yeah, you're shame. Not <laughs> you're not alone, right? It's a very common thing. Um, and she does address it here that the harder you fight, the worse it does seem to get because uh, you're only adding to the cycle. So we'll talk about, you know, she does talk about the floating and accepting thing in future chapters. Yeah. But she mentions it here. So, again, I think as we go along, there's a lot, we're, we're jamming a lot into a short little episode here. But it's just important to if you have the book and you're following through, just just reread it again, maybe after you listen to us and just just yeah. get a grip on what she's talking about, because just understanding it and knowing it understanding what's going on is a lot is a huge first step and then she talks about um from there she does talk about sedation you know we were talking about before we went live that using the word sedation and she talks about you know collapse which i I think would be that total collapse that hospitalization nervous breakdown thing so she's talking about sedation you know at some point people will when she wrote the book it was 1962 so take that with you know into account nothing is working and now i'm just going to be sedated and we were talking about this before we went on the air, uh, I think. For, yeah, I'm not no. sure what drugs they were using in those days. I have the feeling that it was more the benzodiazepines like Valium and, you know, stuff like that, rather than the antidepressants that people sort of tend to get prescribed as long term mm-hmm. things these days. I think I think that's the, like, I don't know. I just know what my nan took yeah. when she was ill. And I think that's um, true. I think that's true. So yeah, like I don't think even I'm, just, I'm not sure how long antidepressants have been around, but I don't. I'm sure that they weren't treating like anxiety with them back then. So I don't know. But so I think when she talks about sedation, she's she's kind of talking about like taking benzodiazepines. I think. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure that that's what she's talking about. I mean, we looked at that. They, the first benzos were introduced in the early '60s, when about the time this book was written, and there were sedatives before that too, but. I think the difference is she talks about the doctor prescribing sedation at this point where the person is fighting and is exhausted and and doesn't know where to go. And they've been doctor to doctor to doctor. And there's a difference now because, I mean, it's very common now where somebody will go to their very first doctor visit, even to just a general practitioner, describe some basic level of anxiety issues and leave with a prescription for Valium or Xanax or, you know, I think especially in... 
outside of the UK anyway, because we've got like the national health, like right, right. where it's all free. So, you know, so like they try not to give out drugs as much as possible. Whereas I think if you like in like private healthcare, like mm-hmm. in America and stuff, it's like the more drugs, the more money. So it's, I don't know how it works. It's a tough topic. We could talk about that one day, like but it, yeah. it sort of is. I mean, I, I, at the risk of catching heat, I, I have my own opinions <laughs> on that, but so she talks about sedation as almost like a last ditch effort to get somebody yeah. peace. And really, at least here in the U.S., we're giving it out almost at the first visit. You know, like, yeah. oh, you know, it's your grandma died. You're feeling anxiety or you're feeling, bam, here's a prescription. So this is the um, pattern we've gotten into here in the last, say, 30 to 35 years. So she talks about it as a last resort writing in Australia yeah. in the 60s, whereas now sedation or use of the benzos has become really almost the first line of defense, at least here in the U.S., which I think is a shame. It shouldn't be. Uh, Because all it's doing is just addressing the symptoms. And then she goes on to talk about, she has a heading called Doctor, He Has Collapsed, which which is so dramatic. You know, Doctor, He Has Collapsed. I can hear her say it, too, if you've listened to her audiobooks, that voice that she had. Um, You know, she kind of talks about that. I guess you get to the end of the rope. You just can't take any more, and it's just this collapse, this literally a, a complete nervous and physical breakdown where you end up hospitalized and that from whatever we want to call that a nervous breakdown exhaustion whatever it happens to be yeah you see it a lot of the time in the i mean everyone's probably got their sort of like and that was like rock bottom you know like when they were just like i've got to do something about this because i've just like yeah i've been in the hospital because i thought i was dying or you know like or like I don't know. People just like get to that point where they're just like, literally, I can't carry on, you know, like yes. something. Yeah, breaks, I'm giving you know? up. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I do remember, you know, and I, I, could, I don't mind saying this too. I remember getting to a point when I really got, really, it was around 1996 or so, and going to my family doctor who gave me the old, if you were diabetic, you take insulin speech, and he prescribed okay. me an antidepressant, and I took it. And uh, I remember at that visit, though, he said, well, this is going to take, it could take two weeks or so before you feel this. And I remember looking at the guy and saying, if you could just put me in a hospital right now and knock me out for two weeks, I would take it. So getting just to the end of yeah. the rope, like I cannot go another day this way. And she does at least acknowledge that people can get to that point. Um, so this isn't yeah. hospitalization because you think you're having a heart attack. This is what she talks about, hospitalization, because you just cannot deal with the anxiety and the, the impact it's having and the fear all the time. And, and you just want to go into that collapse. She talks yeah. about it very in an old fashioned kind of way, but nonetheless, she does, she does mention it. And I think that's what she's talking about here. That's the, it's the difference between running to the ER because you think you're dying and, and literally just not being able to carry on any longer. I mean, I remember, I think like my probably like point of that was, I mean, I didn't go to the hospital or the doctor or anything like that. I just remember um, I was stood at like my, Oh, because I was like 11 at the time and I was stood in my house and my dad was just like, and I just couldn't leave the house. And my dad was like, look, I'm going to stand at the garden gate. It's like 20 feet away in my own garden, you know? And he's just like, just come and stand with me at the garden gate. And I was like at the door, like, and I actually couldn't physically, it felt like, yeah. put my feet outside of the door. And he was just like, but why not? And I was just like, I don't know, but I just can't. And when I realized that I couldn't, literally step outside of my front or my back door do you know what I mean I was just like this is really bad like this is as bad as it gets you know like I I physically well I could physically leave the house but I I just couldn't actually bring myself to physically leave the house I can relate it's just like that's bad (laughs) and I think a lot of people listening and watching could completely relate to that that, yeah that feels like yeah um, so, so it doesn't have to be like a collapse, like a physical collapse or like you end up in the hospital or something. It can just be like that literal point of this, like, I'm not functioning as a person anymore because I can't do this or that or, you know, yeah. like it sort of just gets to that point. Yeah. No, I agree. And, you know, so I think um, we're up to 40 minutes at this point. So okay. I, I would like to do uh, just do I one more. It's kind of the end of the chapter. It is. Right? We're, we're almost near the end, but she does mention the f- Afraid, being afraid to admit fear. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. I have not. I don't think I've encountered anybody or very few people who would insist that they're not afraid. I think everybody. I think seems, I would be one of those people that, that you, you, you insisted, insisted you were not afraid. Yeah, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Oh, afraid interesting. Okay. <laughs> really. Yeah. Okay. And then, like, yeah. And then I think, like, 
eventually I'd be like, mm, maybe I, I like, yeah, I don't know. I just would have probably resisted the, the idea that like, I was afraid of, you know, how I felt just like, I'm not afraid. You've got no idea. It's just this feeling. It's not fear. It's just like this, you know, feeling. I don't feel scared of it. I'm not scared of anything, you know, that sort of thing. That's so. super interesting because I, <laughs> that's very interesting. I don't know if I've ever encountered anybody who's, who described it that way. Well, no, I'm not afraid. Yeah, I'm not afraid of this. And she mentions it that, you know, being afraid to, she talks about one person, one woman that she was working with, I guess, personally, where she didn't want to hear the word fear. So she, she Dr. Weeks had to use the word tension to, to, for, yeah. for months to try and get her to the point where she really understood like, oh, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, yeah. and, and, but again, being, because we, what drives us is that we are afraid of how we feel. We are afraid of some perceived consequence because of how we feel that never happens. Uh, and fear is so much a part of this. But if you are the type of person that refuses to admit that you are afraid, and that's honestly bogus because – you know, I'm as goofball like alpha douchebag as anyone. And I, I'm happy to admit that, yes, I was afraid to walk out of the house. Like fear is what drove it. So, you yeah. know, it is what it is. So she does address yeah. it. So if you're that type of person, it's definitely worth at least thinking about that. You got to sort of embrace the fear because it is yeah. a big part it's of it. It's just making you realize that it's that because I think for me, like when I was saying I couldn't step out the door, I wouldn't have realized it because I was afraid to step out the door. I just... Did, honestly, it was like a feeling I just couldn't even tell you what it was. But if you'd said, oh, it's because you're scared of stuff, I'm not scared of stepping outside of the door. Well, of course I'm not scared. I'm just, I just can't, you know. And so it was kind of like yeah. a bit of a gap of, and I was young as well. So, sure. I, you know, it's like a sort of gap of understanding there. But yeah, so I think that I find that quite interesting. That, Very that, interesting. Yeah, yeah I, it's funny because that was a throwaway for me when I looked at it. But now that I reread it just now as we're talking, you know, that actually may be a thing for some people if you're, you have to kind of embrace the fact that fear is part of this. It just is. Deal with it. Get over it. It's not embarrassing. Yeah. People fear. Fear was built into us to keep us alive. So it's okay. In this case, the fear is misguided and misdirected and happens at the wrong time. But it's okay to be afraid. And fear yeah. does drive this a lot. So you got to remember I'm British and it's from the sort of keep calm, carry on. You That's know, exactly. like that stiff upper stiff lip. Stiff upper lip. <laughs> exactly. Like we're not afraid of anything. <laughs> and, and, and I have to say, just as a, a bit of humor, I don't know, for those of us listening in the States, that accent, when somebody tells you to just pull it together in that British accent, <laughs> oh my goodness, there can't be anything more annoying than that. So you guys got you have the market cornered on that for sure. But uh, we love you anyway. So anyway, um, that is pretty much the end of the chapter. It is a super long chapter. So we, we've been at it for twice as long as we usually are. If Hopefully you hung in this far. Yeah, hopefully. I, I would say reread the chapter. And just like I said, I think the takeaway here is just understand what's going on. Use the chapter to just help explain exactly what's going on with you. It's There's, there's no hints here for cure or anything or recovery that's coming down the road but just the next chapter is the, ne the cure yes, the next yes. chapter is the cure <laughs> so come in next day which we're trying I think we're being pretty good we're trying to do one a week I think we skipped a week here and there but the next one she the chapter is called cure of the commonest kind of nervous illness so that's when she does start talking about her strategy which is yeah. sounds a whole lot like modern CBT so we'll, we'll yeah. get into that but um, and in the meanwhile of course if there are questions comments or whatever if you're watching on YouTube comment in the comment section under wherever it is on your phone or wherever um, or you you can get me at Twitter at that anxiety guy, Facebook, that anxiety guy. Um, we actually had a couple of questions, believe it or not. I answered some questions Honestly. in the past week. Yes, we did. Oh, uh, wow. Somebody asked a question and maybe at one point we'll have to do like a Q and a session. Somebody asked the question, which I thought was really good. I'll bring it up here. Uh, do you think it's possible to recover just with this book? What, what do you say on that, Holly? Um, well, I think if you, understand it enough then yeah like I think one of the hardest things to do with this sort of method is to remember when you're in the middle of panicking or being anxious about like what you're supposed to do because your logic tends to sort of like go out the window um, so it's handy if there's like someone else that can like remind you <laughs> of like what you're supposed to be doing do you know what I mean yep, like it yep. doesn't have to be a doctor it can just be like your 
husband or your friend or your parent or something. Do you know what I mean? Just someone to sort of like work through the method with, I would say. Yeah. Um, but I think you could like, th from this book alone, then yeah, I think so. I don't think I actually got better from anything else other than this. Than the book, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think I mentioned Maybe that like a couple first. of other books that, but like they don't say anything that this book doesn't. Do you know That's what I mean? True. So I kind of just pieced it all together and was just like, oh, and it's actually all in this book in the first place. That's That was exactly my answer. Like if you fully embrace what's going on in the book and, and the concepts and, and you really buy into it, I, I think this book alone would be enough to get you 90% there, probably. You know, maybe yeah. more. I don't know. But uh, so anyway, that was an interesting question that I found that was on the YouTube mm, cool. uh, on the YouTube channel. But I'll keep an eye out. And otherwise, if you have questions, comments, angry rants, whatever it is, send them this way. And <laughs> oh, um, I don't the hate mail. The hate mail. <laughs> don't send hate mail to Holly. She means well. And um, <laughs> we will see you guys in the next chapter, I guess. So come on back. Cool. See ya. I have to stop the recording. Awkward moment while I stop the recording. Ready? Three, two, one. Bye. <laughs>